So, uh, my name is Richard Yao. I'm a perceptual psychologist working for Oculus as a research scientist. Um, perceptual psychologist, basically. Um, basically, uh, that means that uh, I'm interested in understanding how the human perceptual system takes in all this information that's constantly bombarding it and turning it into a conscious experience of the world, uh, which is handy if you're trying to make good VR. Um, so let's see. Uh, I don't have presentation notes, so this should be interesting. Um, so my talk is the human visual system and the rest. Um, I'm using this already. I just want to give a quick plug to uh, the best practices guide, which if you're the kind of person who reads the title pages, I would probably give <laughs> plug uh, for the document that I put together with a bunch of my colleagues at Oculus. Um, it has a much better memory than I do, so if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to check that out. Um, if you're interested in this talk, you'll probably also be interested in talks by our two British Toms, Tom Heath and Tom Forsyth, so I encourage you guys to check out their talks as well. Alright, so um, getting into the talk, you guys probably saw the summary of this online already. Um, this is probably the fluffiest talk you'll hear about to connect. Um, you're going to hear a lot this weekend about the hardware and software that goes into the Rift and VR. Um, this talk is going to be focusing on the human component, um, the perceptual system in VR. Uh, in this case, the human component is cyber reality, getting the crap scared out of him by nine stones. Um, so, this talk is going to have three parts. Uh, I'm going to give you the briefest of overviews to the human visual system, um, which is sort of my bread and butter, is, uh, my training in my training. Um, we're going to move into some discussion of sort of bodily senses involved in perception, and we're going to talk about sensory decisions, which is sort of where the meat of uh, discomfort in the VR experience is. Alright. So, starting with the human visual system, uh, the first point I want to make that is sometimes counterintuitive is that the visual perception is a very active process. Uh, we don't often think of it this way because we open our eyes, we take in the world around us, and we get a lot of things really easily, really automatically. But what, we're, what we don't realize is that this is actually the result of a lot of complex process, cognitive processes going on in your brain. Um, your brain actually, you actually use about 50% of your brain just by opening up your eyes and looking at the world around you, which by movie standards is a superpower. I think that's the point where Lucy started blowing up cars with <laughs> Now, an important uh, phenomenon related to visual perception is a concept known as visual capture. Uh, and visual capture is the word that perceptual scientists have given to the, the phenomenon that um, information that your visual system is receiving is taken as what's actually happening to your body. So it can actually dominate, uh, your vision can dominate over other senses, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. So because visual perception is uh, such an active process, such an important process, um, and because vision can dominate other senses, this makes the rift a very powerful tool. Uh, we forget about it because a lot of us love using it for playing video games and having silly little demos. Uh, I'm calling it this demo silly. Um, but it's a very powerful tool. You're basically providing the only information, the only input that your visual system is getting when you put the rift on. And we have to remember that this is a very big responsibility. And we really have to be designing our content, we have to be thinking about what kind of experiences, what kind of conscious experiences we're building for people. All right. So, um, just to give you a rough uh, model of the human perceptual system, um, this is a gross oversimplification, by the way, uh, there are a few major components of any perceptual experience with vision. Um, at, this, at the core of it uh, are what are referred to as bottom-up processes, or bottom-up information. And this is the raw information coming in from the world uh, that your visual system uses to build up into more and more complex things until you have the world around you. So these are points of light bouncing off of objects in the room around you, actually hitting your retinas, which you're building into lines, which you're building into shapes, and so on and so forth. Alright, so at the same time, um, you have what are known as top-down processes. So bottom-up processes originate in the world, and you build them up in your mind. Top-down processes actually originate inside your brain, inside your mind, and they act on this incoming information in order to help you sort of parse and interpret it. 
<laughs> so these two processes are going into uh, a number of uh, various cognitive calculations, interpretations, and sorting. Um, the two major sort of processes I'm going to highlight here are what are known as binding. Um, first, binding is just uh, the idea of taking some of that visual information and attaching it to certain things in the world. So understanding that um, this sort of overwhelming gray color that I'm seeing belongs to the walls and various Oculus employees' shirts um, versus the floor of this table. Um, the interpretation process is actually sorting that information, parsing it, turning it into something sensible. Um, not even necessarily a story, um, but just understanding what you're looking at. If you're looking at a person, if you're looking at a table, a chair, or a very, very bright spot. Alright, so once you've gone through these processes of binding and interpretation, you finally get this experience of conscious perception. And only after you've gone through these processes do you actually get this concept of <laughs> I love the rock and I wish it the best. <laughs> So, um, still talking about perception here. Um, so the first, uh, first thing I want to highlight is just um, to give you some examples of active interpretation processes happening in perception that you might not normally think about. Um, the first is just the most basic of all, which is recognizing objects. Um, so when we look at this cluttered scene, um, even though it's pretty cluttered, we understand what's going on pretty easily. We can understand that this is a, an image composed of multiple objects, um, if I point to uh, that paperclip container there, you, know, you understand that it's a little tin filled with paperclips. You get this stuff, no problem. You can even understand there's a hammer under all that junk, even though it's mostly covered up. So to use our model here, um, what's happening whenever you recognize an object, whenever you look at the world, is that first you're receiving a lot of bottom-up information. Like I mentioned before, you get points of light, moving little edges, you're getting color information, luminance, um, various types of visual information. And at the same time, uh, in order to parse all this information, you're having to use attention and experience. Um, these top-down processes are having to play a role in sorting out all this visual information. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the screen, so when I point out that tin of paper clips, you have to be able to understand that you can focus on that specific location in space. And you have to use experience, you have to use memory to understand that this is itself a discrete object that's you know, made up of a bunch of tiny little discrete objects inside the discrete object and so on. So Right, so once you uh, combine these bottom-up and top-down processes, um, interpreted what's visual and incoming visual information is there, then you have this final perception of discrete objects. And like I said, this is a very automatic process. We get this really easily, so we don't feel like we're actually doing anything when we look at an image like this. We do start to notice these things, however, when the information becomes more degraded, more ambiguous. So these are some classic illusions you've probably seen before. Um, one on the left, uh, I forget the name of that one, it's something like old mate and the, the young mate and the old lady. Um, so, depending on how you interpret the information, you can see it as either a young woman looking over her right shoulder, and uh, you can see that that her cheek there, there's a little eyelash sticking out. Um, or you can interpret it as an old woman, where the young woman's cheek is one old woman's nose, the sort of choker on the young woman is now the old lady's mouth. Or um, you can see in the gives figure on the right here, this is the rabbit illusion, where depending on how you choose to interpret the, the different pieces of this image, you can see it as either a bunny rabbit or as a dog. So, illusions like this are really interesting to perceptual scientists like myself, um, because when these uh, perceptions sort of lead us astray or break down, that's when we start really start learning something about the visual system. Um, so this is a classic illusion, uh, known as a table illusion. You've probably seen this before. Um, it's just two tables. One looks really long, one looks kind of shorter and fatter. Um, but if you trust that I'm not doing any magic with keynote animations, they're actually the same exact uh, surface shape. Right, so the same thing is happening here, um, it, as in that perceptual model I described. Um, you're getting some bottom-up information, 
in this case, two identical shapes, same exact shapes in physical space here, occupying the same, uh, same areas, same boundaries. But at the same time, you have your top-down uh, processes acting on your interpretation of this information. You have experience with shapes in, in space. Right? If you see shapes, uh, these two identical shapes being projected on your retina, it doesn't necessarily mean two identical shapes are out in the world in front of you. So because we were used to seeing things in depth, um, and the information in this image suggests to us that we're seeing an image in depth, um, we know that shapes tend to extend further in the sort of Z dimension, and so we tend to stretch out the shapes in that dimension. So we tend to think that the table on the left is extended along that length dimension, we tend to think the, the table on the right is extended in width dimension, and we get two different shapes, even though, physically speaking, that bottom-up information is exactly the same. Right, so, um, this next illustration I want to show you guys, um, there's, uh, I don't want to spoil this, I want to see how you guys react at first. Um, there's something very strange happening in this image, uh, besides the flip. And when you notice what it is, I want you to just raise your hand. I'm just killing time this way. <laughs> Alright, so, um, if you didn't catch it, uh, the mountains in the background, if you pay attention to this. Um, so you'll, you'll see that the, the mountains in the background are appearing and disappearing. Um, and this seems really weird, because we, we would think that if a mountain, a whole friggin' mountain, was appearing and disappearing right in front of our eyes, we would notice this. It's so obvious, so simple, right? Um, so it's happening. Um, so there it is, in case you can see it. All right. Um, so bottom-up information coming in is just, that, again, raw visual information. But I kind of played a little trick on you here. Um, it's kind of a, a weird situation um, in that you have that kind of flashing screen in the middle. Um, and what that does is it induces a phenomenon known as change blindness, um, which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, and was also the topic of my dissertation, so I can't help but put it in a giant talk. Um, so basically what's happening is that um, under normal circumstances, when I show you an image just like this, uh, the only thing appearing and disappearing on the screen uh, sort of creates this little flash. Um, it's really easy for attention to pick up on that. In fact, there are theories that attention is actually grabbed by something flickering like that. Um, and you notice the mountains right away. However, when I put that blank screen in place, instead of just those mountains being things flickering, now the whole screen is flickering on and off. Um, and because of that, you're forced to direct your attention around the scene. Um, so this is the key top-down process that I'm exploiting here. And something I want to highlight is what this, what this demonstration tells us is that even though we feel like we have a very rich representation of the world, that we're taking in everything all, all the time, and we can see everything around us in rich detail, that's just an illusion that your brain is playing on you. Um, you can really only take in small bits of information and process them at a time. And that's what's happening in this demonstration. You're having to direct your attention around the scene and figure, okay, is that changing across the flash? Is that changing now? Is that changing now? Oh, mountains appearing and disappearing. Right. So the downside is I get to make you feel silly with little change blindness demonstrations like this. Um, but the advantage to you every day is that you feel like you have a sensible uh, interpretation of the world. You feel like you have this nice, consistent, detailed view of the world around you, even though if that's not necessarily true. Um, but it makes for a nice conscious experience. So this brings us to uh, the first important lesson here. Um, so in summary, perception is an inherently a process of interpretation. We often don't think of it that way, it doesn't always feel that way, um, but that's really what your brain is doing when you perceive the world. Second, um, a lot of stuff just escapes your awareness. Uh, we don't feel like it, but again, there's stuff happening in your head, there's stuff that could be happening out in the world, and you would have no idea any of that stuff is happening. Um, you might not necessarily have ever thought of all the processes that are going into just opening your eyes and recognizing the world around you. So this um, all points to a uh, sort of higher order point, uh, which is that of metacognition. So metacognition is literally just cognition about cognition. Um, our ability to introspect on ourselves and understand how our own minds work. Um, and what these examples tell us is that we're actually pretty poor at metacognition. We think we would notice mountains appearing and disappearing in front of us, but I put a simple little trick here that just involves a flashing screen, and you 
become completely blind to. So um, the sort of more direct application to this principle is that we really, it's really important for us to test any, any kind of rift content that we develop. Just because you look at something and you go, oh, this looks great, it feels comfortable, it's awesome, that doesn't necessarily mean it's true for everybody else. All right. So, mark up one down. Um, this brings, it, brings us to uh, the second section, uh, which is moving out into the bodily senses. So, when we talk about bodily senses, there are really two major systems we're talking about. The first is the vestibular system. This is composed of uh, some organs inside your inner ear, the semicircular canals, and the autoliths. Um, not necessarily important here. What is important to know uh, is that they detect acceleration. Uh, you might hear the vestibular system referred to as kind of your sense of balance. Um, that's technically true. Uh, what it's doing is it's detecting the acceleration of gravity to tell you which way it's down so you don't fall over like I did when I tried to get up on the stage. Um, so, uh, what the vestibular system is doing is it's detecting uh, accelerations that your head and hopefully your body attached to it are undergoing. So every time you undergo some kind of acceleration, you turn your head, you get moved, you go to undergo linear translation, your vestibular system kicks in and says something is happening. It's basically your body's accelerating. Um, the second is the proprioceptive system. Um, you might not have heard of this one. It's uh, in kind of popular textbooks. Uh, it's basically your, your sense of your body's position. Um, so it's sometimes related to the sense of touch. It's basically a system of uh, receptors located inside your muscles and inside your joints that tell your brain and help it compute how your body is positioned at any moment in time. So uh, my ability to close my eyes and know where my arms are, to touch my nose uh, when I'm sober, um, is thanks to the proprioceptive system. Because I know where all the parts of my body are and how they're positioned. So the final point here that I, I want to highlight is uh, this idea of multi-sensory integration. And we often talk about the senses as very separate things, um, and it becomes very easy to forget that when your, your mind is going through this process of perception, taking in this bottom-up information, applying top-down processes, coming up with an interpretation of your conscious experience, it's taking all your senses into account. And they can actually influence each other and interact in interesting ways that I unfortunately don't have time to get. Alright, so one demonstration of um, kind of these systems in action uh, is what's known as the vestibular ocular reflex, uh, which I'm demonstrating in this very creepy video I made of my eyes. So that's the magic of the of VOR. Um, basically, uh, VOR is your eyes targeting system. Uh, it's what lets you kind of block your gaze onto something and move your head around and keep that sort of locked in place in your gaze. Um, so, basically what's happening here is that your vestibular system is taking in information about what kind of movements, what kind of accelerations, translations, rotations your body is doing, and it sends a signal to your eye muscles and tells them how to perfectly counteract that, uh, or at least as well as they can, they can counteract that motion. So what's interesting about uh, VOR is that the bodily senses are what are driving your eye muscles. It's primarily serving vision, and vision does play some role in some correction of uh, keeping your eyes locked on something. But for the most part, it's your bodily senses driving what your eyes are doing, even though this is primarily something subserving vision. And this has some interesting consequences. So, applying this to the rift, um, it's, it's really important that what gets displayed on the screen is updated properly with head. If, under normal circumstances, when I'm in the real world, if I want to keep my eyes locked on this microphone, I can move all around, I can turn my head, my eyes will stay locked on it, and that information always stays there. That visual information is always right in that spot, right in front of me. Because it's in the real world, it's physical world, it's not moving. But when you're in the rift, you have a screen glued to your face, well, not literally glued, but you have a screen right in front of your face, and if I turn my head to the right, the screen is now is still in front of me. So now in order for the visual information in front of me to stay in front of me, I have to update the display to move it to the left. Or to the right, I guess. Um, so that's all well and good in theory, but there are lots of ways this can go wrong. Um, if you have bad distortion settings, if you have a bad head mark, um, I'll leave you to uh, read more about these in the documentation if you don't already know about them. Um, 
but they can cause rendering updates to uh, basically occur incorrectly. Uh, things will, won't move the way they should move in response to your head movements, and that's going to create some unusual experiences. Um, this is the same reason why we recommend against just placing static image in front of you. You're not updating the image uh, in any kind of way if you just place a static image in front of someone, and that can feel kind of weird. Um, other causes here, lost position tracking, judder, drop frames, latency, um, little things that we normally wouldn't uh, think too much about can have a very big impact on your conscious experience of what's happening to you. So what's happening here um, with VOR and the Rift? So if you're moving your head around, you're getting some bottom-up visual information at the point of gaze. Right? In the real world, it's whatever's at, at the location, but in the Rift, it's whatever's presented at the screen at that location, at your point of gaze. And the thing about VOR, and the lifetime of experience you have with VOR, is that your mind already expects some typical point of gaze behavior. It expects that visual information at the point of gaze, when you're looking at a stationary object, is going to stay there. However, if your display isn't updating properly, if there's some lag on it, if there's bad distortion sensors, bad head model, what's going to happen is that the, the visual information isn't going to update properly, and it's not going to stay at that same location in space. It's going to start wiggling around. So what ends up happening, the, percept, the final interpretation that your brain builds is that when I engage VOR and I move my head, stationary things stay still, and this thing isn't staying still. So you get these odd percepts of objects moving, or because of some of these uh, some of these factors can impact the way the entire world is rendered, um, then you get this interpretation that the entire world must be moving, uh, which again, because of visual capture, can be very disconcerting and discomforting. All right, so I just want to highlight an important lesson number two here. These previously minor issues, these little rendering things we normally didn't think about, the way the scene is projected, the way the, the field of view is projected, the way the, the screen is distorted, um, little bits of, of dropped frames and latency here and there. Um, these are actually now incredibly important to our conscious experience inside the Rift. All right, so um, finally, which I think I'm halfway through the talk, I should say finally. Um, <laughs> So this brings us to the third section, uh, which is a discussion of sensory disagreements. Um, to bring up again visual capture, um, vision can again o overtake whatever your other senses, whatever your other senses are reporting, and lead to to this experience that the conscious percept that you get, the conscious perception you experience, um, is whatever your vision is telling you is happening. All right, so. The most common experience, uh, uh, sort of anomalous experience you would, you would have in Rift is what's referred to as vection. Vection is what perceptual scientists, uh, the term perceptual scientists use to refer to any kind of illusory perception of self-motion based on visual information. So, vision tells you that you're moving through space, your body s says that you're sitting still in a chair, and that leads to a sensory disagreement. Right? So there are various theories you can find on why this is uncomfortable, why this uh, leads to discomfort. Um, they have varying uh, pros and cons and points of validity and things I disagree with. Uh, but at the core of all these theories is this idea that if there's any disagreement between your vision and your bodily senses, you're going to feel discomfort. It's similar to how if you're sitting in a car uh, and you're reading a book, your vision is going to be telling you you're sitting stationary or if you're inside a ship. Um, your vision is going to tell you you're stationary, but your vestibular organs are going to know better. They're going to say you're moving through space, and you're getting jostled around. And this can lead to sea sickness, car sickness. And the same that goes for simulator sickness, cyber sickness, V rides, visual induced motion sickness, however you want to refer to it. Alright, so one thing um, that a lot of developers have uh, tried experimenting with, and uh, the other perceptual psychologists <coughs> at Oculus, uh, Dr. Yuri Petrov, uh, has been playing around with it's this idea of head-based control. And head-based control is uh, pretty simple. It's the idea of using the sensors in the Rift so that your head movements can now steer your avatar, or steer the camera around. And the core idea here is to provide some kind of uh, vestibular input to your to those organs in your ear and sort of line up the senses. So 
And instead of your vestibular organ saying that you're sitting perfectly still and vision telling you you're moving, your vestibular organs still, still get the sense that something is happening. Your head is undergoing some kind of motion. Um, and that lines up the senses a little bit. So in theory, this is a, a great idea. Um, However, one thing that I can report here is, is a bad idea is um, you want to avoid using head tilt to rotate in place, um, which in theory sounds like a reasonable idea. Say your head, your head is a, uh, a joystick and you're tilting it around to move in, in space. Um, however, you might not necessarily know that this actually induces uh, what's known as the Coriolis effect, or when it's in VR, the pseudo Coriolis effect. Um, so this occurs any time that your body is rotating on one axis of rotation and your head is tilted off that axis of rotation. Um, if you've ever played Dizzy Bat, uh, Dizzy Bat takes, uh, it's not a rift game by the way, it's actually taking a bat and putting your forehead against it and spinning around. Um, if you've ever done that, uh, then you've played a game taking full advantage of this coil and stuff. Alright, so little things like this are, are one of the reasons why we always recommend testing. Um, this is, again, one of those things that seems pretty straightforward, seems like it shouldn't happen have a huge impact on people, but can actually make people really uncomfortable. All right. So the important thing uh, to know about sensory disagreements is that even if we created the perfect rift, the perfect implementation of VR, where the hardware was perfect, the software, the SDK was perfect, everything was projected perfectly, there was no latency, there was no judder, you can still create discomfort through these sensory disagreements. So the primary source of, of these disagreements comes from locomotion or camera movement, uh, which are this one and the same in the case of first-person content. Any kind of locomotion or camera movement is going to lead to vection. And it's going to be worse if it's some kind of movement that the player is in under control of. All right, so since uh, vestibular organs primarily pick up on acceleration, uh, acceler any kind of visual acceleration is kind of your main culprit here. Um, it's what's really giving rise to the disagreements because that's when your vestibular system would normally expect to to be active. So one approach people have taken is if they have movement in, in their content to make sure that it's uh, at a constant velocity and it's moving forward in space. Um, and this does seem to help because um, if you were doing that in real life, just as you would in the rift, your vestibular organs would be silent. Uh, they wouldn't pick up on anything because you wouldn't be undergoing any kind of acceleration. Um, however, since uh, vection is, is completely visually driven, if you look away and you stop experiencing vection, or you close your eyes, and you start looking at it again, suddenly the vection kicks in again, that's like a little acceleration right there. Um, so, constant forward velocity can help, but it's not necessarily a cure-all. Right, so, at the core of the problem is, is this conflict. So if we prevent the conflict between the senses, then presumably we should get more comfortable experiences in the river. And there are a lot of ways that um, people have played around with this, and the things we played around with ourselves. Um, but, at, but at this point, we, we really want to fight vection. We want to prevent uh, this experience of illusory self-motion. And to fight it, it helps them to understand it. And vection primarily comes from what's referred to as optic flow. Optic flow refers to any kind of coherent motion in your visual field that all signals together that you're moving through space somehow. Um, so this GIF I have here uh, is suggesting that you're moving forward through space. But if the coherent motion were moving in a different direction, if they were all sort of moving to the left, that would suggest to my brain that I was moving to the right. So, again, because of these bottom-up processes, um, the more optic flow information you provide the brain, the more evidence it has that you're moving, and the more vection you're going to experience as a, as a result. So, one way that, uh, one method that seems to help combat this experience and cut off some of this bottom-up information is using a cockpit in your game. And there's some disagreement over how well cockpits actually work. I've seen, heard various explanations for why they do or why they don't work. I'm going to try to present uh, kind of uh, theories that I like that I think are most scientifically sound. So if we take the average cockpit, the primary reason it's going to work is because it's blocking off this bottom-up information. You're getting less evidence that your body's moving through space. There's less optic flow, so you're going to experience less vection. <laughs> at the same time, um, at the same time, they, there, there's the, the room for them to not work because of this top-down process, of this actual interpretation of being in a cockpit. Uh, right? Because even though you're getting less optic flow information, 
And what I would still know is that if you're in a cockpit, right, so this doesn't really uh, completely round, sort of uh, block off this perception of motion. Right, so uh, in approaching this problem, we thought it, we, we were trying to think of ways we can attack this. And uh, what's core to these ideas is that action is still a perceptual process. It's still something that your mind has to build up um, for you to experience. And so it, it's, it's subject to all the ways that you can potentially manipulate the way your mind is working. So one, one uh, effect comes from just keeping the mind occupied. So if your mind just has less resources available to process this information and tell you that you're moving through space, then you're going to experience less affection. Um, there's evidence in the research literature that suggests that keeping people engaged with some kind of attention demanding task is going to reduce the feeling of affection. So, just by virtue of having a game that people can play, that they'll keep them occupied, trying to do something with, with some kind of goal, um, that's actually going to help them come through uh, But another approach to uh, reducing discomfort um, is actually using these cockpits for effortful reinterpretation, um, which is kind of the weirdest, nerviest way of putting something that I've seen said tons of times on the internet, which is this idea that the cockpit somehow grounds you. Um, I've also heard things like, I use it as kind of my frame of reference, um, that helps me feel that. And what these people are doing, as far as I can figure, is that they're, they're, they're effortfully telling their minds that, okay, I'm sitting stationary in this chair, and the cockpit is stationary around me, and so we together are stationary, and all this motion, all this optic flow I'm seeing in the world, is actually the world moving around the two of us, in the center of our little universe. So this seems kind of weird, it seems like a, a bizarre thing to do. Um, but we actually do this all the time in perception. Um, so I showed you some ambiguous figures before, this is kind of a classic ambiguous figure. Uh, this wireframe cube, uh, it's often referred to in perceptual science as the Necker cube, because that was presumably the first guy to doodle it in the margins of his notes. And we can interpret this inf ambiguous information as either a cube facing downwards to the left, or a cube facing upwards to the right. Not too difficult. Um, but this scales up. Information can be ambiguous even when it's really complex. So this is a, a great illusion uh, by an artist in Japan. And in, embedded inside this image of the silhouette of this woman spinning around is actually two interpretations. Um, you can actually see her spinning to the left or spinning to the right. Um, you'll sometimes see this on the internet uh, marked as some kind of left brain, right brain test. That's nonsense. <laughs> So, I bring this up because something that we can do with these kinds of ambiguous bits of information, um, like all visual information is in the world, is we can encourage certain interpretations over others. So, with the Necker cube, it's really simple. You put a face on one side of the cube, suddenly it disambiguates it, and it's really easy to see it either as the left cube or the right cube. And as complex as the spinning woman or the silhouette illusion was, we can do that there as well. By introducing a few visual cues and simple information of contours where her eyes are, um, you can very easily see these two interpretations now. Um, if you couldn't before, you can now just sort of look to the left or look to the right. And then when you look back at the silhouette, it's going to be spinning in the last direction that you saw. So it becomes really easy now to switch between these. So, Again, visual information, bottom-up information is inherently ambiguous, and we're having to apply these top-down principles in order to um, interpret that information. And these interpretations can come out differently depending on how you choose to apply them. So, we started playing around with this idea a little bit. An important caveat I want to make, um, is we haven't done sort of rigorous scientific testing on this. These are just some prototypes we've played around with in the office. Uh, but we wanted to try playing around with some of these ideas. So, when we looked at cockpits, um, how do they help optic flow, or how do they help uh, comfort by, by blocking infection? Uh, we first did the most straightforward thing, which is, well, let's just block off the periphery the same way a cockpit. And that seems to help somewhat, um, but it actually didn't have that big an effect. You still sort of felt like you were moving through space. Um, and the reason was because all the, even though you were blocking a lot of that optic flow information, the only information your visual system was getting was that out in the world, stuff is moving. Um, so, even though it had very little information, the only information your brain was getting was say, telling you you're moving through space. 
So just blocking off the periphery didn't seem to do anything. However, if we now attack the bottom-up and top-down aspects of this person, and we give the brain an interpretation, we encourage it in direction. In this case, we stuck the person inside a uh, inside of a, a virtual living room. So, um, credit to Tom Heath in the back of the room, by the way, for building these prototypes. Um, so, if you attack both of the, these uh, these aspects of the problem, it actually creates a much more effective um, tool against fighting an action. Uh, because now, in addition to blocking off that, that peripheral motion, you're also giving the brain a top-down interpretation to apply to this information. Now, yes, you're getting some, some of this optic flow information, but you're sitting inside a stationary room. And there's never the case where you're sitting in a living room and your house is magically flying through space. So this actually felt a lot more comfortable because we were packing the problem from both directions. Of course, um, this has limited applicability of even VR and can kind of defeats the purpose. Um, <laughs> The first thing everyone always said to me. Um, but uh, it, it actually was a pretty cool effect. It was like having a magic TV that was a portal to another world. Um, but limited effort here. So we tried scaling this up with another little experiment um, using what are known as independent visual backgrounds. So um, can't take credit for this idea. It was actually developed by uh, some researchers at the University of Washington by Thero Draper and Furness. And they had a theory developed around what they referred to as the inertial reference frame. And the idea of the inertial reference frame was that uh, in processing the visual world around you, your brain picks some visual information cues in order to determine what's staying still and what's moving relative to that reference frame. Right, so when we're sitting in this room, our inertial reference frame is this room, the room is stable, and any movement you see, if I walk around, if I move around this podium, I'm moving relative to this room. So because we have so much control over the visual world in VR, um, what these researchers did was they, they artificially created a stable inertial reference frame for people. They, they provided visual cues that, said, that told people, you are sitting in a stationary room, and any motion you see happening on screen is happening relative to that reference frame. So this essentially amounts to uh, a player locked skybox, which is how we actually implement it ourselves. And this is one of those things, like so many things in Rift, that's a little hard to describe in words. Uh, but once you put it on in the Rift, it just totally makes sense, and you totally get what's going on. Um, but what happens is by using this, this lock skybox, you essentially flip the interpretation that your mind defaults to when it sees optic flow in the Rift. Um, whereas it used to see the optic flow and say, oh, I must be moving through the world. By providing the player lock skybox, you're able to flip this interpretation and tell the brain, I'm sitting in a station, stationary reference frame, and any optic flow I'm seeing is the result of the, move, the world moving around me. So, just to give you a, a visual here, um, this is a, a recording we made of our prototype. Um, it was just taken off into KHD a little while ago. Um, so this is just how it works normally. I'm moving the headset around here. Um, you can see, you can look around this room. It works basically the same way any kind of rift content. So I'm using uh, the, the keyboard keys now to sort of move around the space, and you can see everything everything moves in reaction to the key presses. Right, so con to contrast this with uh, the prototype, what you'll notice here is now uh, that sort of stationary holodeck background we, we created, we projected back there, um, is going to stay still even though I, mean, I use the keyboard. So if I pick up the headset, I look around, it's like looking around an actual giant holodeck room. But now if I set this headset down and I start moving the keyboard keys, you'll notice the background stays rock solid and stationary while the environment starts moving around. And this was the, this was the main idea behind the player lock background. And this seems to be really effective around the office. Again, it's something we, don't, we haven't sort of rigorously tested yet, um, but the, ba the background research literature already has told us is effective in reducing simulation. So it was, a, it was a nice little prototype, but there are some pros and cons. Uh, the pro, like I said, it, it seemed to be pretty effective. The main disadvantage is, uh, first, is applicability. Um, it's not necessarily something that you can throw into uh, just any type of content. It might not make sense in different types of content. And furthermore, it's not clear what the best practices are. And this is something that even the original authors of this idea um, cite as uh, something that they were still working on. Uh, 
less they publish on this. So I'm not really sure what makes for the best lock background, the best independent kind of visual background um, to have, provide the biggest uh, benefit and comfort. And even though we have the basic core concept of this prototype down, there are still, there are still some major challenges. Um, so for instance, since this is based on seeing the skybox, uh, we figured, hey, if you go into a cave or, some, or something that blocks the sky, you're not going to be able to see this environment. Um, so let's make it transparent. Let's make it so that you can see this locked background uh, through the environment. And that's what, why you can see the grid lines uh, through the ground. However, when um, we were playing around with this, um, something that we didn't immediately uh, predict would happen was that if you um, actually turn up the opacity on the grid, made it so that the, the yellow lines are now overlapping uh, with the ground. Even though our projection was telling, what was saying that this grid was projected out into infinity, the disparity, the, the parallax in your eyes, said that this grid was out in infinity. Again, this interpretation that your brain made didn't match up to the bottom-up information. Um, Anytime something occludes something else, if object A is occluding object B, it's in front of it and blocking the view of it, um, object A is always behind, in front of object B, object B is behind object A. And that's the interpretation you get from this background. And the final percept was basically that you were stuck inside this yellow holodeck cage and you're now flying around inside the cage. And that doesn't really do anything. So figuring out what, how to properly implement something like this is still a major challenge. So, um, final lesson, important lesson number three here, um, is that there are a lot of challenges and opportunities present now in, in, in building VR. We have unprecedented control over a particular individual's uh, visual perceptual experience. And while this provi provides us a lot of new opportunities for creating unique and creative experiences, uh, there are also a lot of challenges to making them properly comfortable. This also highlights the importance of content design. Um, it can be very easy to make someone very, very uncomfortable or very comfortable in your content. And it's all going to depend on how you decided to present different visual information and what kinds of visual information you choose to present to your user. And finally, what uh, this, uh, some of these examples I hoped uh, illustrate is that there are still a lot of creative solutions out there that you might not necessarily have even tried yet. Um, there are things that we might not necessarily have thought could help or hurt comfort and are just waiting to be discovered um, that creative developers have, have yet to um, come up with and right. So finally, my conclusion here, uh, some points I want to leave you with. Again, uh, vision, despite our intuitions about it, is a very active process. It's inherently a process of interpretation, even though it doesn't necessarily always feel that way. And second, um, because the Rift is providing your vision, the only information it has to interpret what's happening to, happening to you in the world around, uh, relative to the world around you, the Rift is a very powerful tool. And as such, comes with very important responsibilities um, to your users. And finally, uh, because of the, the limitations of the human perceptual system, because of the, the, the unprecedented unprecedented control you have over, the, over their experiences now, um, this presents to us new, interesting new puzzles, uh, both on the end of understanding how perception works, uh, but also in understanding how you design content that's fun, that's engaging, um, but still works within the confines of the, the, this limited perceptual system that can lead, so easily lead to discomfort. And the final, uh, optimistic note I want to leave you on is that this is a constantly evolving field. Um, never before in the history of technology have we had some a tool quite like the Rift. Um, and as much as we know about perception and as much as we know about virtual reality, there's still so much we have to learn about both. Um, and I'm excited to be doing both with everyone here in this room and beyond. So, uh, thank you very much.